Now, hello everybody and thank you for coming this morning. Welcome to our last day of First Thought Talks here at the Galway International Arts Festival. And the, the talks are delivered in partnership with our education partner, NUI Galway. And we're very grateful for their support and assistance. Just to let you know that all the talks are being recorded. So if you have any friends who are too tired to get up this morning or, you know, just couldn't make it here for some reason or another, tomorrow, Professor Pandit's wonderful talk is going to be on the YouTube channel of GIAF, as are all the other talks. If there's anything you missed and you want to catch up with, that's where to go for those. Now, the past year has seen extraordinary advances and unprecedented collaboration between community, clinicians, researchers and industry in the world of medical technology to find urgent solutions to global healthcare problems. What does this mean for the future of medicines and medical device research? Have healthcare goals changed? Are there technologies and treatments within our grasp now that just a year ago seemed out of reach in our lifetime? Has the pandemic hastened the arrival of more personalized therapies that work for individual genetic codes? Professor Abbe Pandit, Scientific Direction of Quorum, the SFI, Science Foundation Ireland's a Research Centre for Medical Devices, based at NUI Galway, will reflect on the opportunities that have arisen from the pandemic, which will advance our ability to improve the quality of life for people living with chronic illness on a global scale. He was telling me earlier that things move now into more therapeutic um, positions. Stents, yes, are wonderful, but there are other therapies that can deal with heart failure, with things like Parkinson's disease. So all very hopeful, especially for those of us getting on in years who fear some of these blights are going to strike us at some point. Uh, it's nice to know that there's something going on about that. So he's going to talk about that, and he's also going to talk about the idea of sustainability um, in terms of what we may have learned from the pandemic, particularly in relation to climate change. Please welcome Professor Abe Pandit. Thanks very much, Katrina, for a very kind introduction. And thank you all for coming in on a, on a Saturday morning. Uh, delighted to see you, all, all of you. So what I'm going to do today is, uh, is going to talk about uh, hope, you know, the positive ramification of what happened. And I want to be, I'm very clear on, on, on one thing. The pandemic was awful. I mean, I'm not going to say this is all, I mean, what I don't want to say is that pandemics are good for good things to happen. Uh, pandemics have resulted in some of the actions that we see today, but there are probably ways to prevent what happened today. So th that's the premise of the talk because what I, what I was when I when I gave this talk I was like well I hope people don't think that you know we're going to have you know it's it's great to have a pandemic no it's not also what I'm going to do today is something very different than what I normally do uh, which is uh, use murals I've been fascinated and fixated with murals of late um, and use murals as a backdrop to the story that I want to weave. Uh, what I find fascinating about murals is is the is the most accessible art that you can see. You know, it's 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 art of permanence. It's there on most of the times in disengaged communities, so it's very accessible. Um, it is uh, and it conveys a message most of the time of of what is the present state of in that community. If I were to sometimes the global face. So I'm going to use that as, as a backdrop to the talk, and, I'll, I'll, uh, and, and the story that I'm going to talk about will be around that. But before I start, uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want to show you a film, uh, which will resonate to all of you, but give you, an, give you at a local level what, was, what is happening. And it's a trailer I'm going to show you. Uh, so it's only a short trailer. It's, it's a film that we, Kuram, as a, science, as a, as a national uh, uh, SFI research center, Commission, and it's a trailer to just give you a hint of what is to come. It was like being faced with an unknown enemy and you were constantly sort of ready to battle. I have a, a one-year-old and a four-year-old. You know, the last thing I wanted to do as a healthcare worker was to, to make them sick. You had to constantly think, am I putting myself at risk? Am I putting my colleagues at risk? We saw these terrifying scenes in Italy. They had to make life or death decisions due to scarcity of resources. We were having conversations with hospital staff about ventilator supply in Galway, and I think the number was somewhere around 20. 
that to me was just petrifying. When you hear COVID-19, all you think about, all you feel is fear. We just did not know where we were going to put these patients. So we had to plan and plan quickly for that. We needed to start thinking about solutions very early on. So I said I would take a look to see, could I work on a design that could be made using 3D printing technology. This is a typical ICU ventilator and we haven't modified any part of it. What we've done is we've made things to add on to it. So what we wanted when we were building the device was a device which was easy to manufacture and easy to build to scale. So the whole thing can be hand assembled on the bench using nothing more than an allen key. I didn't want to be sitting at home watching people die. I wanted to actually feel like I was making a difference. Medical devices typically take three to five years to develop and get to market. We were trying to do something in four weeks. We've always said right at the start, this is kind of a doomsday scenario. You had clinicians at the front line saying, yes, this would work for us. You had the creative med tech people saying, well, let's try and come up with something. Engineers, IT people, nurses, doctors, all working together. There was an intangible call that came to all of us to point of action. And magic happened. So th this was a this was a film we just uh, we just commissioned and it was shown on TJ Kahar and you know we can provide access to whoever wants but it just sort of showed how the community in Galway came together with scientists engineers students all of us came together at this point of action and the, and the messaging there which I would like to give is it's you know at at the first time the research funding that we've got was put to test and it showed that action. So before I start start the talk, I want to I want to acknowledge um, a, a lot of quite, quite a few people. I want to acknowledge Claire and and Lindsay, a, a part of a communication team, uh, Macek, who's in the beautiful graphics that you will see. Besides the murals were done by him. He's in the audience. Thank you, thank, thank you, Macek. Una Fitzgerald, who always reinforces the idea of sustainability in me, and Molly, who who uh, she's she's also a professor Molly Byrne in behavioral sciences, who also talked about behavior change, and she was she was a member of NFED as well, and my partner Matthew Wallen, who's also here. And also, I want to acknowledge uh, the taxpayers and the funding agencies which have funded my work and. Uh, and industry who fund who fund our research. That you as taxpayers do uh, do essentially fund my work, and I and I owe the work to you. Uh, also, I'm also impressed with with the with the Banksy's uh, uh, he she it whoever this artist is. We don't know who it is, but it's Banksy's painting in Southampton, which is thanks for all you're doing. I hope this brightens this place up a bit, even if it's only black and white. So it's a it's a it's a beautiful uh, uh, beautiful painting, which was given to, a painting was given to the Southampton Hospital, he just, uh, he or it, whoever the person is, left it on the, on the hospital saying, this is my thank you to what you do. Uh, again, uh, you know, scientists, clinicians, thank you for what you've done. So who am I? I'm, uh, I did not get into medicine. I started off very well. I, I was a total failure in many ways. Uh, I barely passed engineering uh, in, 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 uh, in, the, in the first three years. I barely scraped through. In the final year, somehow something, something happened, and I stood fourth in the class. I don't know what happened. Uh, I failed in the first years of master's. I switched universities, uh, I, and then I, uh, I managed to get a PhD, uh, and I was hired to uh, in, a, in the industry, uh, I was laid off from the first two industry jobs. I worked in large, you know, a large company, and then I worked in small, small companies thereafter. I was laid off. Uh, I come from a middle class family from India. Uh, they were very uh, up with the times. Uh, they were uh, very bohemian in their, uh, in the in the way of outlook, in the context of very progressive in nature. Uh, I I never wanted to be an academic, but here I am uh, as a professor in biomedical engineering. So this is who I am. Uh, in just so whatever I say you take with that caveat of my baggage that I have. <laughs> so again, in the, in the context of the caveats that I have, I, all, all the opinions I'm going to say are personal opinions in nature. Uh, I do have a bias. I'm a scientist. So I'm biased. Science is beautiful, wonderful, and great. That's what my bias is. Uh, I do have conflict of interest. I do work with uh, industry quite a bit. So, so take, again, with a, with, a pill, uh, with a pill of what I said. Data, what I present, some of it is not primary data. It is, uh, it is, uh, I, have, I have acknowledged most where the data comes from, but I just want to show it's not my data. Uh, 
Uh, and what I'm going to present today is analysis from peer-reviewed sources as much as I can. Um, uh, again, this is a nice mural again from Snowy Regional Council of the faces that we have. You know, so again, you know, I wear different faces, so that's where, that's where it comes from. So this is, uh, you know, you, you all must have seen this beautiful blob uh, of this virus, you know, very colorful and everything else. But the virus actually looks like this. You know, uh, the coronavirus, this is the first image uh, from the China National Microbiology Data Center, the first one of COVID. So it's under an electron microscope. That's what, that's what we look under. That's what they look like. The, and the second picture was a bit more refined. And you see this, it's not as glamorous as we see this beautiful colors and, you know, and what you see is a 3D model of what is there. So essentially, this is, this is the virus that we all know what is known as the, as a, as a COVID-19 virus. Now, I'll show you a series of bureau, but this is, uh, this is just to say this is where we were, you know, messages of stay at home. You know, uh, and this is an artist in LA in a very downtrodden area to say, you know, Simpsons, stay at home, huddle together, watching television, Netflix, whatever we could. You know, this wasn't only an, a, a Western phenomenon. The messages were also everywhere. You know, this is in Kinhasa, which is the capital of Congo, 10 artists uh, painted a wall in the, con in the context of mistrust of science, saying, you know, we need to keep social distancing. So again, you know, the messaging of science reached even in even the even in uh, in the in the in the southern world you know this is uh, i love this artist mubon mubon uh, is an artist who plays who's paying tribute to the fight against coronavirus he's used uh, two uh, two winged figures uh, uh, who are who are trying to press the virus against so this isn't he's a uh, mubon is in thailand he's he paints on on derelict buildings. Uh, so what he did was he was he was trying to say you know and and for for the first time the community of muralists came into across the globe drew pictures of how to combat this thing. So again, science was science was reaching out in in many places as you see. And this I love this one. This is in Berlin. Uh, this is Gollum from from The Hobbit. You know, treasuring this uh, uh, treasuring this toilet paper he found because at at one point earlier in the pandemic it was saying, well, you don't go out. You know, try and avoid people. So let's let's keep things together. Um, this is in India uh, again. Again, uh, you know, uh, frontline workers creating as heroes. A lot of them being inspired by science, clinicians, in engineers, and so forth. But also a post a post person uh, delivering security people who put their lives uh, out there uh, for the pandemic. And again, the superheroes cheering them. This was uh, this was this was in Delhi just after the huge uh, uh, huge wave that happened recently. Again, uh, again, uh, again inspired by science. This is a nice one again. It's a 16-year-old Greek graffiti artist who was basically in lockdown, but also was trying to chronicle um, what what was, um, uh, you know, stories which have not been told about uh, other effects of besides the disease itself. This is a painting of a woman who was uh, who was beaten up due to domestic uh, domestic abuse, and he's painting her face on top of his building where he lived because that's the only place where he could find because Greece had a severe lockdown; they could not go out anywhere. Again, a fantastic representation of of how how muralists responded uh, in in their own art form in in, in this way. <clears throat> uh, lots of media, as you all know, social media went crazy all together, and media scares me more than Corona. Very nice painting in Berlin shown itself. So it's again a very nice rendition of that piece. Uh, what also came about, uh, you know, was also the the transformation in language, science language. You know, words like mRNA, immune system, DNA, pandemic, virus, genes, proteins, vaccines, came a common language. On the street, you could talk to someone saying, oh, I got an mRNA vaccine. I got this vaccine. I got, I got a protein vaccine. I got, a, I got AstraZeneca. I mean, you would not have heard this before. You know, what a transformation in language that we saw uh, in, in this space. Words like quarantine, it's not a scientific language, but again, but quarantine is, is, is more scientific and when you quarantine people, so quarantine became a part, of our, a, a part of our lingo and continues to be a part of our lingo. 
Again, a, a very positive messaging here by, by showing a, 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 a maternal figure, most likely a nurse, trying to give a vaccine that's positive, saying, well, you know, I will be very careful with you, but we, you, know, you need to get vaccinated. Again, this is in, in Brazil. So the messaging was global. You know, it was a global impact that happened. This is again showing that the messaging was not only from the healthcare workers also, but from the, the people who were getting the virus, saying, okay, well, the virus is important. I am proud, I'm a pensioner. I am proud of getting this, uh, this vaccine. And this is a mural in Argentina saying, okay, I got this vaccine, you know. Now, this was the biggest vaccine campaign ever. 5.82 million doses. As of yesterday, I checked yesterday, 5.82 billion doses were given, 184 countries, 42.6% of the global population has one dose today. Now, I will not talk about the disparity. I know there is a disparity in, in, in the percentages that are present in, in, the, in the northern world and the southern world. I'm not going to refer to that. But regardless of that, 42.6% have got one dose. That is phenomenal. At a rate of 29.6 million doses a day. That is just amazing. Now, I will spend some time on this slide. If you look at the vaccine innovation space, you know, if you look at typhoid fever, this was when in 1880, we linked it to a pathogen, you know, in this you know, virus or bacteria, whatever, you know, we linked it to a pathogen. Pathogen is a general word for anything that causes any pathology. So we linked it, this was the time, and the vaccine in which it was used was in 1919 to 1880. That's a long time to get something done. You look at others, such as polio, you know, it's 1920, 1950, 30 years. You know, Ebola, 1975, just recently we got an Ebola vaccine. Here, one dot. Amazing, just absolutely amazing. I mean, this is just, I, I mean, I can't, I can't believe it. When, actually, when, I was, uh, when, when somebody said to me, it's like, oh, we're going to have a vaccine soon. We hopefully, we'll get a vaccine soon. Uh, at the start, I was like, there is no way. I, I, said, I said, there's no way on earth we're going to look. Look at what the past has shown. But I'm glad the past proved me. I mean, I was proven wrong. You know, it's, you know there's no way we're going to have a vaccine. I was, it's absolutely impossible. So if you look at the vaccine development process, right? So what normally happens is an exploratory phase. We, as scientists work in the lab, look at, you know, what is the cause of pathogens? And, you know, let's say whether we can, we can create a formulation that can work. We go to a preclinical phase. Most of the time that involves a lot of animal studies. Uh, then we go to a clinical trial. Phase one is normally just a safety study. We just look at a small cohort of patients. Is it safe or not? Phase two, you go to an efficacy. Is it effective? And phase three, you look at the larger cohort of population. Is it showing efficacy across multiple demographics and so forth? And then it goes to a regulatory approval process. In the U.S., it's FDA. In the EU, it's the it's it's a it's a EU EMA uh, EMA framework. And then, or any other country may have its own regulatory framework. And then you go to manufacturing because there's an investment there. Each of these stages requires a huge amount of investment. Just to say that most of this funding for exploratory and preclinical work, most of it is work is normally done in universities most of the times, because that's where you make mistakes and you do iterative work. Most of this work is done in, with the industry. You know, so a lot of investment goes over here, but this investment is much more higher than this investment. This is just, to, just a framework of what I'm going to get to next. Now, this is a very serial process. So if I had a formulation, I would do a preclinical study, and then I will hope somebody, some industry gets interested, some funding agency wants to pay money for it, and then do it, right? Yeah. So I'm always waiting for funding. In the COVID time, in, in case of COVID, a lot of lateral things happened. You know, the exploratory preclinical, I'll come to that later on, was already done. We knew those things. The clinical trials, the approval process and manufacturing processes were concurrent. These, all of these processes were squashed up. The regulatory agency was saying, we want to know what you're doing right every minute. Saying, okay, you did your phase one, okay, good, why don't you, can, can we start phase two? 
Can we start phase three? Can we do this? So there were systems put in place globally. This is not just one. It's not only FDA or EMA. Everybody was saying, we've got to take care of this. You know, how can we mobilize best? So this, and can we manufacture concurrently? So industry invested huge amount of money in creating those formulations that they want. So as soon as we can get approval, we will not wait for three more months to get the vaccines out. We will do it right away, right? So all the processes happened right away. Everybody knows uh, these DNAs, and this is a nice artistic impression of DNAs and RNAs and, and so forth. But I'll little bit talk a little bit about science or what happens around that. What I do want to mention is that current vaccines did not happen magically. They are a result of decades of ongoing work. The first RNA vaccine was tested in 2001. It did not happen last year. You know. 2005 to 2018, there was a lot of biological understanding of what happens with the, with the, with the coronavirus. SARS coronavirus, by the way, came in 2003. That was a, infected about 8,000 people, 774 people were, died in that. So there was a lot of work that went on behind the scenes in, uh, in, the, in different labs around this. There were no big company invested in this kind of work. There were two startups, if I were to say so, BioNT and Moderna being another one, were barely scraping through while trying to work on MERS and other, other, other uh, disease targets. You know, barely getting funding. Okay, we got funding for two years, we'll do something for two years. It was just kind of, okay, let's, let's survive, right? Um, they were also started becoming interested in, and I'll come to this later on about mRNA. You know, mRNA was, is not, associ you know, we associate right now with only corona, but mRNA is huge. You know, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But there was a personalized RNA cancer vaccine trial. Moderna started in 2017. Bio Entech, which is Pfizer owns it now, started a cancer vaccine trial in 2017. This is way before Corona, right? First confirmed case in 2019, right? When Corona hits, both the companies, Moderna and Pfizer, take what we know from your decades of work, and and comes up with a with a uh, with a with a formulation which was already sequenced i'll talk about what sequencing means later on and the vaccine trials all of them just peer heads right so it 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 wasn't mag it what was magical about it was the was the process was was fastened the regulatory process the clinical trials everything but the science was there you know the science has always been there so what happens? This is just a preliminary one. So you, you have a target pathogen. You know, you, you, it could be a virus or whatever. You, know. you do sequencing. Sequencing means understand, understanding what it is. You know, there's a code around, around every virus, everything else. So let's understand the sequence of what is going on. Right? You, you do an electronic transfer. So by the way, Moderna never actually even handled the virus. They got the sequence a computer sequence. They never even touched the virus. They got a sequence from China. China said, okay, we want to deliver, deliver this. They send it on a computer file to them. This is the virus sequence, okay? Then they come up with a vaccine design, formulation testing, and then they did mRNA production, and then they do a manufacturing, which is more of a clinical grade, and vaccination, right? So this is, this is just a very simplified way of doing it. But more importantly, what are the fields of expertise that's required? You need an infectious disease expert, you know, who talks about, who knows what infection is, an immunologist who understands what the immune response is, a geneticist who understands what the codes are, computational people who can make this sequence on a, on a computation, the beautiful 3D diagram that you see, it was done by computational people, and someone like me who does formulation work, uh, who does, okay, we have this, uh, with this mRNA, how can we formulate this to get to the patient? This is some, something that I, I, I would have done, not so much in vaccine, but I, that's what I would do. Uh, and toxicology to say whether this, this will work or not. 
and chemical engineers to make sure that these processes that, that, are, that are present can, are repeatable and so forth. And the regulatory affairs clinicians and so forth. These are, the, these, these are the core individuals involved in getting the vaccine. I'm not talking about clinicians and other scientists which are, in, which are also in the ecosystem per se, but these are the fields of expertise which actually make the vaccine. So, so it, is, it is a highly collaborative effort. You know, it's not a trivial effort when you, when you say, but these are inherent in most systems. Right? We have them present. This was, uh, I like this figure, this is 1989, where mRNA was, uh, was injected into mice. So it's an injection of mRNA was not new. 1989, we were injecting mRNA in our labs. You know, not me, I was, uh, I was quite young then, but, but, uh, but we were, there were scientists who were there. But RNA is actually not very stable. You know, it degrades right away. And I'll tell you why it degrades right away. So this is a cell. This is now cell made very simple, right? So in the sense, cells are never circular in shape. Cells could be spindle shaped, could be all kinds of shapes. But for, for everyone, for simpl simplification purposes, this circle that you see is a cell. This is a nucleus, which is the heart of the cell. Inside the nucleus is a DNA. DNA codes is like, is like the heart of a cell. Right? It, it tells what the codes are. This is where RNA is, is transcribed. In other words, there is a code that sends from the DNA, and this mRNA goes outside the nucleus and goes in a box, which is called the ribosome, uh, and then protein is produced. So the cell's machinery works in such a way that you, you have a DNA which gives out a code. mRNA is the messenger. Which, which gives the code, and, and, and that messenger gives the protein. So the mRNA basically goes a very short distance within a cell. And if you look at the cell, the cells are very small, like they're very, you know, uh, you know, micron level. So you're talking about this distance being a few nanometer distance. So mRNA gets degraded right away. It doesn't have that much of a lifespan, right? So the protein is produced thereafter. So the mRNA itself gives the messages for the cells to produce what, what we need. Now, this is inside a, uh, so if you take that mRNA, right, uh, we need to protect the mRNA because it degrades. And now forget the words over here, it's a very busy slide, but what I'm gonna tell you simple things is, this is the mRNA because it, gi it gives out the code. The mRNA needs to be protected. The way to protect mRNA traditionally has been using what we call as a liposomal system. You know, so liposomal systems are made up of lots of sugars, uh, of carbohydrates and so forth, phospholipids, cholesterols and so forth, because that, this is negatively charged, this is positively charged, it protects the mRNA. You know. And then me as a polymer chemist would say, okay, we need, to put, we need to bind all of these together, so we use a polymer called PEG. Uh, we'll just call it PEG. So we use this formulation. It's a very old formulation, nothing new. Liposomes have been used for a long, long time. And a very simplistic way that we can protect the mRNA. So mRNA is protected by this system that's present, that's liposome, right? So when we have a liposome, uh, which, which contains the mRNA, and when we inject, inject itself, uh, it, uh, it goes to the cell. The cells will, what we call endocytos, or take the liposome in, the ribosomes come, the, sorry, the mRNA comes out, protein is produced, and your immune cells will identify that, that protein and will produce antigens. So we are training our body for that immune system by using synthetic mRNA, right? So we're using the mRNA, we, have, we know the code, that's what, they, that's what most companies are doing, and, uh, and, and, and then we, we produce uh, an immune response which will target the, uh, the pathogen that's present. So it's, it's a training process that we do. So this is a simple process. It's nothing complicated. That's what, and the same thing we would do with, with other vaccines as well. Now, there's a huge pipeline for mRNA vaccines. You know, so we, what I did want to say before, which I didn't say is that, you know, the liposomal system itself, if you see side effects, by the way, it's not got to do with mRNA. It's got to do with the, with the liposomal presence and the PEG molecule that's present. Is a polymer that is present, it is giving us a side effect. It's not the mRNA, you know. Um, but nevertheless, there are a lot of mRNA vaccines coming on the, on the, on the forefront. And, and you can classify them mainly as prophylactic, which would be infectious diseases. So Zika virus, uh, metanemovirus, 
uh, influenza virus and uh, chikungunya virus, which is pre prevalent, highly prevalent in South Asia, rabies virus, they all are in phase one clinical trials, which is a safety trial that are ongoing right now. In the therapeutic phase, mainly cancer, solid and liquid, liquid tumors. When I say solid means uh, which are in the, in the solid phase in which we have lung cancer and breast cancer, they're all solid ones, solid tumors. Liquid means blood, blood cancer, you know, or, uh, and, and, and myelomas. So those would be all, all uh, in, in the therapeutic phase. So again, phase one, phase two. So what, in, so, what, so what does mRNA do in this context? Is when you put an mRNA in, we identify what the code is for the cancer cell, right? Just like, so it will treat, just as for the coronavirus, we're looking at pathogens is what we want to attack. In the, in the virus, here we are training our body to say that this cell is not a good cell. This is a cancerous cell. We've identified the code, we get the mRNA, just like the genetic sequence genome, put it in the formulation and we do it. Again, not rocket science, but again, we, we can do that simplistic process and then we can do it. Why have we not done it yet? Because, because uh, these, these, uh, the, the pathway for regulation was so long. You know? Only now we are getting some funding into the clinical trial space. So my lab has been working, and I'll keep this only one slide from my own lab. You know? We have been working for safe and efficient delivery of RNA and DNA for a long time. We did. You know, so what we do is we take biomaterial systems. I'm a material scientist, so we take we make biomaterial systems, and we can encapsulate these DNAs and mRNAs and so forth for an efficient delivery systems. And we can even make little nanoparticles. We call them nanoparticles or microparticles, where we can encapsulate these very nicely. And we can use better polymeric system besides the liposomal system, which can make them non-toxic. You know, PEG that I mentioned before was a toxic substrate, so we can make them much better. Right? So we can even make nice capsules here. This is a hollow capsule uh, made of a, of, a, of a material which is like collagen. Collagen, as you know, is present in our body. It's a protein in the body. We can make them, we can fill them with DNA, mRNA, and then we can release them nicely in the, in the, uh, and we can get nice functional RNA. So we, can, we have all this technology in the lab. We have been working them for last years. But let me just say, all the research projects of this were abandoned. I left all of this work seven years ago, you know, you know, because funder determined to be high risk. Nobody would fund this project. I remember going for a big center proposal, about 50 million proposal based on only mRNA, sRNA. All of them said, this is too risky. We are not going to fund this work. You know, uh, and it, it's not only me, but all Moderna and Pfizer, everybody, uh, everybody said, you cannot. You know, we are not going to fund. So they have struggled all the way through in getting that funding present. But the technology is there. The science was there, you know. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing Now we are coming back to. So, uh, so I was talking to uh, some friends yesterday or the day before, and they're saying, why are you not doing this now? It's like, well, it's, there are better people doing now than I have. You know, we have done it. We know the science. It's, it's great. And I'm glad to see its fruition. But the history is there. We have, we know how it's done. So moving slightly differently is where do we see the future uh, all about? As I, I mentioned about mRNA therapeutics as cancer targets, and that is, that is brilliant. It's, we're going to see some really nice trials coming in, uh, and, and mRNA studies are going to be funded, which is fantastic. There's huge investment coming from industry in that space. If you're working in mRNA, it's brilliant, you know, and I, I would all the power to them. You know, we are also doing a study from the center, not me personally. The center I'm in, we are doing, uh, we are doing an mRNA trial in cystic fibrosis. John, Professor John Laffey, who's an anesthesiologist here, we are scaling up production of mRNA with a company called Factor Biosciences. So we are doing it in Ireland. Within Ireland, we are doing that study. So we, you know, in the local context, we are we are also in in that play. There are fantastic therapies because the regulatory. We know now that the regulation piece. Has been uh, has been short circuited, rather short circuited is not in a, in a positive way to see technologies out there, and also we know that clinical trials can happen, but maybe the non-risk technologies can come to fruition. So one of the areas that I think is going to really going to take off is the variables in medtech. You know, there's a whole convergence of medical technologies, especially in artificial intelligence, digitalization, and everything else, and we want. 
every all our data and even during covid time we saw a lot of digital uh, uh, breakthroughs in terms of data and you know even covid tracking systems and everything else imagine that you know you're having a blood pressure done and you know and it will be detected and then you have your ambulance coming right away you know so uh, yeah, i mean there is a there, there will be a whole digital revolution that just waiting to happen in the context of sensing and treatment both so sensing your data and then treatment following thereafter you know and 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 that is going to be very very exciting so so the, so wait wait look and look on the horizon for wearable medtechs where we can actually uh, that's that's where the future lies the other area which i think is going to be really really hot is called organ on chip so what does that mean so this this actually comes, this idea comes from semiconductor industry uh, so you can have these electronic chips and that's exactly what it is the technology to make the chips is there so we have we can make these chips but can we create, emulate little organs over here that we can study better? So what does, why organ and chips? So then we wouldn't have to study, do lots of animal studies. You know, imagine if I was doing liver cancer work. You know, I don't have to test 50 compounds in 4,000 animals and huge amount of money required. Whereas I can make, I can have 5,000 chips here and screen all the compounds right away. So, and not only that, if I want to say, if I want to say how is cancer cells moving from say blood vessels to the lung or from the bone to the, you know, they call metastasis, how do we, how do we, how is cancer moving from breast to bone? So imagine having a breast tissue here, a synthetic breast tissue here and bone tissue over here. We can study the migration of those cells across that. So that's, that's the whole technology behind organ on chip. That's very, very exciting. So we actually have a doctoral program called Lifetime in within Galway, where we can, we are looking at how we can do this next generation of, uh, of organ on chips and we can, we can be at the forefront of, the, of, of, of in that space. The other area which I think is very, very exciting is, and all of you know 3D printing, uh, where you can actually now, you know, we, we were working in 3D printing 20 years ago where we were creating metal implants and so forth. Again, no takers. <laughs> you know, nobody wanted to invest in it, which is, which is fine. I'm, I'm glad we created the science behind what, we, what everybody's doing now. So, but 3D printing is now coming to Forte. We can make jewelry, you can make pots, you can do all kinds of funky things. You can even have a 3D printer, uh, you know, right now in our library over here in, in UIG, we can even, students can go and make different projects on 3D printing. So it's become very commodity accessible. But we want to go to the next level. Can we bioprint tissues? You know, so can we actually take our cells, take the materials, me as a biomaterial scientist, who know what, know what materials we can, can we bioprint these cells at the right concentration, the right cells at the right place, the right distance? Can we print that is the question we are asking. So we are now looking at bioprinting. Now again, with, uh, with the regulation that's present, you know, can we fast track that process in which we can actually test out com compounds at a three dimensional level? You know, uh, because what I mentioned on, uh, you know, most of the compounds that are tested are tested in 2D, not at a 3D. We are working with cells. Cells are 2D, you know, on a petri dish. But tissues are on 3D. So can we create these substrates in 3D? And we can test them. Is is a question we are we are uh, we are asking. So again, that's a revolution which will also make medicines better. Now, why are these technologies going to see the light of day? Besides what I mentioned about regulation and manufacturing, I think there are other things that I think has happened because of COVID that we see uh, these technologies at the, at the at the next level. And this is a uh, I'm going to show you some figures of, uh, of SOCI, which is the science index, which surveys 17 countries. There are 17 countries that are, the survey is done. In each country, 1,000 people of different demo demographics are, are, were surveyed. And this, is, this, this comes from 3M a comp uh, industry, but this is their public outreach program. So they, they look at this and, so in other words, there are 17,000 people surveyed in this. And I'm gonna, I'm not, the survey is huge, but I'm just, I'm gonna just pick a few uh, themes in this survey. So again, at the backdrop of mural, uh, fantastic mural with, uh, with in Russia uh, uh, by Vadim Baidov, he's, you know, there's a, uh, there's a there's a clinician saying back off you know uh, you know your time has come we are going to win there are five themes that underpin the state of science this is the latest results that we see 
you know, uh, hope is number one, which defines the sentiment of people. Number two, trust. Number three, equity in science, renewed focus on STEM because of the pandemic. Four is sustainability, which is we are more aware of science as part of the solution of the bigger issue. Fifth is shared responsibility. And I'll talk about each of those uh, in, in, a, in, in the next slides. You know, so again, five themes, very critical. So it's not only about science, but there are other, the other things that will make, I believe, the earth a better place. Hope. A year into the pandemic, the defining sentiment for science is hope. There is definite hope. We see hope. The fact that you all are here today is because we have hope. All over the world, science is bringing hope for the future. And this is 89% of the people who surveyed said science give me some countries more than others. Uh, but 89% said there is hope because of science. Science has influenced behavior during the uh, pandemic. 91% people feel that they agree that in order to contain the spread of COVID, people's actions should follow scientific evidence advice. 91% people feel that. 88% people feel that vaccines are essential part of science, and that's come from science itself. 82% feel that scientific advice is necessary to feel to stay safe, was essential. So it was science has influenced our behavior. Uh, itself and and that and and we see the results thereof. Again, a nice mural of uh, of of uh, of uh, Heidi Evans Corona Lisa drinking a uh, beer of Corona, uh, and then with a mask present, plastered over her bags and memes. Again, a very nice saying. Behavior has influenced. Uh, you know, science has influenced behavior. Another one, The Lovers, Two Lovers by Pobel Byrne in, in, in Norway. Pobel Byrne is a very famous muralist. Uh, again, two, two, uh, two lovers uh, expressing their love with their masks, uh, masks on. They both were health workers. They didn't want to, uh, you know. So it was, again, a very nice story of behavior change which, which comes into, into, into the muralist. We are counting on science to 85% people felt that science will save us from COVID-19 pandemic. 79% said science will make it possible for pre-pandemic norm in 2021, and we do see that today. When asked, what are the top five healthcare priorities for science beyond COVID-19? At tight places were vaccine number, vaccine and cure for chronic diseases. And again, if you look at the effects of mRNA cancer, you know, again, cancer is number three. Chronic diseases would be diabetes, Parkinson's, neurodegenerative like Parkinson's, MS, and so forth. All of them are now within reach of what we want to do. Number four is uh, addressing behavioral health issues and health and safety of, of medical workers. Again, very poignant uh, priorities for, for people itself. Trust, where there is hope, there is trust. Trust in science is very high. Uh, what I want to point out is that 35% of people feel uh, that I only believe science that aligns with my personal beliefs, which means that 65% are saying that alignment of my belief with, with, with uh, whatever, whatever my beliefs are, do not, inf you know, I will believe in science, which is phenomenal, which is really, really good. And that's down 7%. It was very high before that my beliefs come first and then science, but now it is that, that tide is shifting. There is less skepticism. You know, there are people, 75% of people will defend science now than ever before, post pandemic. You know, again, a very nice image uh, by a graffiti in, in Illinois in Prospect Heights saying, showing Albert Einstein, imagination uh, against science in very difficult neighborhoods coming, Albert Einstein with equations and everything. It's a phenomenal thing to see in, in very disengaged communities. And again, this is in Senegal, uh, where in the absence of handkerchief, cough and sneeze into the crook of the elbow. So again, they're following the advice of the, of the science that's present. Um, this is in Gaza City. Rana Ramavi works, uh, creates sand sculptures, asking people to stay at home. Again, a very nice story of saying science. Scientists are saying, stay at home. We believe in you. We trust you. Let's, let's do the right thing. 
you know, and again, superheroes, this is Belfast, you know, we have, you know, scientists and clinicians and everyone else were given the superhero status that, you know, we are here to save the world, you know. So that's a, that's a, that's a symbolism that came across everywhere. And again, in areas such as Belfast, we know what kind of murals have been there in the past. So it's something more positive light was very nice to see. Shared responsibility, you know, cross-border and public-private sector collaboration are key, are absolutely key. You know, science can be considered as a catalyst for collaboration. And we've seen that in the film we are trying to, we try to document the same story, is that, and, and people also feel that 67 people believe that science can unify. And we have done that across the globe. This is not just a Galway thing, not a Western world thing, Northern world, Southern world. It's across the globe. And the murals itself show you quite a bit that science is a unifying factor. We have shared data from China to Moderna showing what the genome was. There is collaboration that's happening across for, for one particular purpose to save humanity. Very nice collage again, I love this collage, which is a collage by Cardiff artist Nathan Wibben, who, who uh, this was inspired after the first clap for the carers. And again, I was, uh, and you know, he created a collage of all the people in the community and created this beautiful, absolutely stunning murals, which talks about collaboration itself. You know, it's fantastic work. We want more science investment and it should, uh, and should shape, uh, is, is a sentiment of people, not scientists. This is, everybody said there should be more investment in science. So give an example, the GNP investment in Ireland is only 1.16% of our GNP, very low compared to 2.5% in EU, very low. So, you know, we may think science is well funded and it's actually not compared to the EU average. For a, for a developed country that we are, 1.16% is very, very low. That is a very low percent. But to see science, you know, what we want to see is that, uh, you know, this is the right time with hope, trust. We have everything that's going. We want to see more, more investment coming into the science. And that's because we want to live in a sustainable world. We are more aware and science is part of the bigger solution, right? If you ask people, uh, what are the big issues that scientists should work on? Climate change is on top. What I will say is we cannot couple climate change from health. Absolutely not. You know, if, if, the, if, we, if we, we need to link the two, effects of cancer are very well known because of climate change. Well, for survival for one, we won't even be alive if there are wildfires going across California. You know, what happens in California is going to affect Ireland. You know, we cannot decouple that. You know, what happened in China affected the whole world. What happens anywhere globally because of climate change is going to affect Galway, Salt Hill, wherever we are, Naknakara, wherever we live, it is going to affect. We need to be conscious of that fact that something happens in Africa, something is, doesn't concern us. That world, we do not live in that world anymore. Sustainability of everything is important. The pandemic has, so most people felt that pandemic has opened our eyes to sustainability issues and science is part of the solution. 77% say that pandemic has made us more environmentally conscious and that is true. We saw birds, you know, I live in the city center. We suddenly saw all kinds of birds in the city center. We suddenly we were like, why they we were probably occupying their land. You know, they were, they were here before. So what I'm going to do is, uh, actually, you all know who Greta is, uh, Greta Thunberg, but I, I was really moved by what she said recently. She said, um, the corona tragedy, of course, has no long-term positive effect on the climate, apart from one thing only, namely the insights into how you should perceive and treat an emergency. She said, because during the corona crisis, we suddenly act with necessary force. The pandemic had moved people all over to world to action. All parts of society come together and politicians put their different view aside and cooperate for the greater good of everyone. People in positions of power in politics, business and finance have said they will do whatever it takes as you can put a price on a human life during the pandemic. But when millions have died because of air pollution, she said, those lives we can put a price on. And that's a very powerful thing to say. So anyway, my closing statements um, uh, is are on a positive note. You know, pandemic has enabled, hasn't necessarily caused scientific discoveries, has enabled scientific breakthroughs uh, within public reach. 
broad range. Everybody, each one of you have participated in this. It's not scientists only, not clinicians only. Each one of you in this room have participated in, in that whole, whole mission. Regulation breakthrough I talked about is, you know, you know regulatory uh, uh, breakthroughs have happened in which we can speed up things to, to get to people. Public educational transformation has seen, and I use murals as an example of how that can, can happen, is collective ethics. We all were tied down to collective ethics of action. What I would say is we need consistent investment in science is needed to build on what is gained. We need a regular investment in science, and sustainability is at the heart of future health. We need to have a sustainability. If we can do this for the pandemic, we can do this for a better Earth. So with that, I want to leave this with this image of, uh, of, of Seth, who's one of my favorite neurologists in Paris, who's looking at, we need to think about a future generation. And, not, and, and as Native Americans would say, you know, we need to think about a seventh generation. We don't need to think about the first generation, next our own children, but the seventh generation that we leave behind. And that's what I leave it at. You know, we need to think about climate change, but climate change also affects our health. So it's all in one, and let's not decouple the two. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Just hang on for the mic. Okay, Abbe, just an absolutely brilliant lecture. You covered so much material um, in a very accessible way, and I loved the art as well, so well done. Uh, my question is perhaps um, a selfish one. Um, now that all the technology is there, how fast will, it, will the scientists be able to produce vaccines to the new variants? Because presumably there are going to be new variants and perhaps even more lethal variants than the Delta. So how can you see that progressing in the future? Uh, uh, it's a very good question, Angela, but we know, you know any new variants, um, we know the code. You know, we've shown this. A lot of the variants, if I were to say, have been produced because of mismanagement of in the ecosystem that we live. You know, the India one is a good example of that. You know, I mean, you know, the, and I don't want to get too political here, but you know, the government did not do enough to protect the people. And variants, you know, viruses are... What I know of, that I'm not a virologist, but what, what I know of viruses, they will mutate over a period of time. But if you don't stop them, they're going to do it. So it's a political will at play. Yes, yeah, scientists can create vaccines. And, you know, they can do it quickly. But it's also got to do with political will, right? So if, you know, the places, if you look at places where the, the, the key question is, where are the variants being produced? UK was one of them. India was one of them. Brazil. You have to wonder why the variants are coming from there, <laughs> you know. So, so uh, yes, that doesn't mean we should not care about them. Yes, those variants will come here and it will affect the whole global world. But th there is another, so that's one political issue. That, that is difficult for me to answer that question. But yes, we as scientists can identify the genome and, and do this process. The manufacturing piece, we are now scaled up to do that, to do the vaccine. There is enough willpower for us to produce vaccines. You know, the regulatory piece of it is fairly straightforward. I would say, if we can do this in one year, the variant next, next booster could be done in three to six months, you know. But I would hope that there is a bigger willpower in the social political space where these variants don't come. Anyone else? No? Okay, I'm going to abuse my position and ask the question myself. But one of the fascinating things that came out of this, and by the way, 
The amount of information that is packed into this presentation is stunning. And because it's, got, it's recorded, you'll all be able to go back and say, yes, that is what I heard. That is the information about what's going on and um, amaze your friends with your fantastic levels of scientific information. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's really rare to get so much incredibly valuable information in such a compact form. Speed, Professor. One of the things you pointed to uh, substantially throughout the paper was the speed with which things got done. And you are saying, suggesting that that same speed, which comes from, of course, collaboration uh, consistently across different uh, professions and different areas of society, can be replicated in terms of climate change. All of us here in this country are wondering what exactly is the delay about solving our health service crisis and our housing crisis. And one of the things we don't do sufficiently is to interrogate those delays. We now know that it's possible to have effectively a national health service because it was done during the pandemic when private hospitals were taken over by the public service. And now we seem to be slipping back into the old ways we've watched What's happened with Sloan Chicare, um, six years in, no progress at all. Obstruction from bureaucracy, all kinds of difficulties there. Because the pandemic, this is the question in a long-winded way, because the pandemic resulted in, in dreadful deaths for large numbers of people, is that the only thing that would concentrate political and bureaucratic minds sufficiently to move on other things that are in the end just as important. Do you, is, is, that, is that a hope you have, or do you think it's well-founded if you do have it? Well, I would hope that we don't have another pandemic to realize that we can do this, yeah. because it's too late. Yeah. You know, uh, what I'm trying to say is we have tools now to avoid future pandemics, but that's got to do with climate change or anything else. We have tools. We know we have done it in the present world. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about Spanish flu and all that stuff, but that was that was decades ago, but now we have tools. We have ways of communication, we have established collaboration, we have trust among nations. I'm not talking about scientists, I'm talking about trust among nations that we can do it if there is a will, mm -hmm. socio-politically. There is enough money in the world. Mm -hmm. There is enough money in the world. Mm -hmm. There's enough money in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't have to go far. We have enough money in Ireland you know, to change the housing crisis. We have enough money to change. If there is a will, yeah. And the will is, is, has to be shifted. So what I would say is, I would, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question the way, I don't know what you're expecting, but what I'm going to say is we as individuals have a way to change that, is to ask your politicians, mm -hmm. when they come on your door, mm -hmm. tell them how much are you investing in science, how much are you investing in climate change. Mm -hmm. Ask them that question first. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, I, I wouldn't say what not to, don't ask, I'm not, I mean, I don't want to say what you should not ask, and I'd rather not say that, but what you should say, the first thing, what are you doing for climate change? Mm -hmm. yeah. What are you doing for science funding? Mm -hmm. That's the first two questions you should ask. Everything else will follow. But if we, if we play local politics of X, Y, and Z, when am I going to get A, B, and C in my neighborhood, or D and E and F, we are losing the bigger plot. Mm -hmm. What are we doing for climate change? How much are we investing? How much are we investing in science research? Because we want our politicians to stand in the doll and say what we, irrespective of party politics, we, what are we doing for climate change? That will change, transform the whole thing. Yeah. Thank you, that's, that's a comprehensive answer. Um, I don't hold, hold out much hope at the moment considering the whole country has been consumed for at least a month with a minor appointment by a previous minister <laughs> to a job. While, you know, the world is reeling with all kinds of problems. This is what has obsessed not just the politicians, but the media too. And the media have a huge role to play in all of this. Anyway, I think we learned so much from you this morning. Uh, thank you so much for coming and educating us about all of this and for giving us some hope. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Albert. Thank you for listening.